to foot by asking my wife for a paternity test. This didn't happen today, but a few weeks ago, and that day changed everything. My wife is the best woman I've ever known. We've been married for over four years, and for almost as long, we have been waiting for our first child. Our son was born last year, and at first everything felt like a fairy tale. I looked at him, amazed by his tiny fingers and his smile, thinking, could life get any better? But then the doubt started. Not right away. When we first brought him home from the hospital, he looked like any other baby, tiny and fragile, with slightly wrinkled skin. But as time went on, I began noticing things that bothered me. If you've seen me, you know I have blue eyes and very fair skin. My wife is the same. She's a real beauty with delicate features, blue eyes, and fair skin. So when our son started to grow, his skin became significantly darker, and his eyes turned deep, dark brown. That's when I started to wonder, is he really my son? It all started with a few playful comments from friends. They joked, saying, well, he doesn't really look like you. Then my family started asking why he looks so different. Their seemingly innocent questions began to gnaw at me. I spent sleepless nights reading forums filled with horror stories about men who found out their children weren't actually theirs. One evening, sitting at the kitchen table late at night, I casually asked my wife, Are you sure a little guy is mine? I said it half-jokingly, hoping she would laugh it off with me, and we'd both dismiss it as a silly thought. But she looked at me with such cold eyes that I could hardly breathe. Of course, he's yours she said sternly, and we never spoke about it again. But the doubt didn't go away. It showed up in every corner of my mind, like a shadow standing behind you when you think you're alone in a room. Before Thanksgiving, I decided I couldn't live with the feeling anymore. I suggested we take a paternity test. It would erase all my doubts and return us to normal life. She looked at me silently, then just nodded. No drama no yelling. She agreed, and I thought that was a good sign. Deep down, I was sure we'd sort everything out after the test. And then came the weeks of waiting. I went to work, handled my usual tasks, but every time I looked at our baby, I felt an odd emptiness. I couldn't enjoy his laughter without that nagging question in the back of my mind. What if? One day, I came home from work to an empty house. At first, I thought my wife and son had just gone to visit someone. But when I walked into the bedroom, there was only silence. A letter lay on the bed. A cold chill ran down my spine. I opened it. It was the paternity test results. And they confirmed that the baby was 100% mine. No doubt about it. My son was my biological child. But next to the test results was another paper. A petition for divorce. She left no explanation just those two documents. My son is biologically mine, but now I'll only see him on weekends. And my wife, the best woman I've ever known, is no longer by my side. I sat on the edge of the bed, holding those papers, and all I could think was, how could I do this? How could I doubt her? I had lost everything because of one stupid fear, one phrase I couldn't hold back. I realized I should have trusted her. But that trust had been shattered, not just because of the test, but because of that moment when I questioned her loyalty. Now, I often think about how trust is like glass. Once it cracks, you can't put it back together the same way. And even if you manage to fix it, there will always be a scar, a thin but visible line. My marriage was that glass. And I broke it. Could I have prevented it? Maybe. But time can't be reversed. My life now consists of weekends with my son and long evenings spent thinking about how deeply I love my wife and how painful it is to lose her over my own insecurities. I often wake up in the middle of the night, remembering the look in her eyes when I asked for that test, seeing the disappointment that can never be undone. But here's where it gets interesting. A few weeks after we began living separately, I received another letter. It was from my wife's lawyer, suggesting we meet to discuss reconciliation. A flicker of hope ignited inside me. It turned out she wasn't entirely ready to end things. She still had hope, 
and maybe I'd have the chance to fix everything. Now I know, if that chance comes, I'll never give in to doubt or fear again. Trust is fragile, and it's easy to lose. But if you truly love someone, you have to be ready to protect that love from your own fears, even when everything seems to be working against you. After receiving the letter, my life took a sharp turn. That letter wasn't just paper, it was hope. I carried it with me everywhere, reading it over and over again. But along with hope came anxiety. What if I couldn't convince her? What if she had already made up her mind and this meeting was just a formality? The days leading up to our meeting dragged on endlessly. I would pick up my son on the weekends, and every moment I spent with him reminded me of what I had lost. I tried to be the best father I could, but I constantly felt incomplete. In the evenings, when I returned him to his mother, I was overwhelmed by emptiness. I'd watch her walk away with our child in her arms, and each time, it felt like another part of me shattered. Finally, the day of our meeting arrived. We agreed to meet at the cafe where we used to spend a lot of time before our son was born. I got there early, sat at a table in the corner, and waited. My wife was always late, but this time she arrived right on time. When she walked in, my heart pounded even harder. She looked as beautiful as always, but something was different. The warm glow in her face was gone, replaced by a cold seriousness. We sat down across from each other, and at first, neither of us could speak. It was a silent pause between two people who once knew every detail of each other's lives, but now sat in silence like strangers. Finally, she broke the silence. You know why I'm here, she said quietly, looking me straight in the eye. I didn't come here to just end things. I want to understand if there's anything between us still worth saving. I listened. But inside, everything was churning with emotion. What could I say? I had destroyed her trust, and now I had to fix what might already be broken beyond repair. I know I ruined everything. I finally responded, my hands shaking slightly. But I never wanted to lose you. It was just a stupid fear that ate me up inside. I should have trusted you. I love you, and I always will. She listened silently and I couldn't tell if my words were reaching her. Then she slowly nodded. But you didn't trust me, she said, her voice not angry but tired. And that distrust killed us. You don't understand what it means for a woman when her husband doubts her. I felt it in every glance, in every suspicion you had. My heart tightened with pain. I understood it now, but at that moment, I felt it even more deeply. I had hurt her, not just with my words or the request for a test, but with every moment of doubt I allowed to grow between us. I want to try again, I said after a long pause. I know I can't fix this with just an apology, but I'm willing to work on our relationship. We can be what we were before. She looked at me intently, as if weighing every word, and I sensed that she wasn't entirely ready to let go of us. Maybe there was still a tiny spark of hope left in her. I don't know, she finally said. I need more time. I can't just trust you again like that. You have to understand that. But if you're really willing to work on this, we can try. We'll start small, slowly, without rushing. Those words were my salvation. It was a chance. A chance to regain what I had lost. We agreed to start over slowly without big expectations. I knew that from now on, every step would matter twice as much and I'd have to put in enormous effort to rebuild her trust. Months passed. We met a few times, but our relationship was more like friendship than anything romantic. She kept her distance, but I felt the barrier slowly melting. I saw her smile when she watched our son, and in those moments, I realized that not everything was lost. But the ending of this story isn't as simple as it might seem. One day, when I came to pick up our son for the weekend, she stood at the door, carefully holding him in her arms. I knew something was wrong before she even spoke. It's hard for me to say this, she began, her voice trembling. But I've realized that I can't be with you anymore. It's not because of you or what you did, no. It's because of me. I just don't feel what I used to. Her words hit me like a cold shower. I've been ready.
to Fubai sitting through my friend's orgy. This happened yesterday, and I still can't wrap my head around it. It was supposed to be a normal day of brunch and day drinking, but things took a turn that I never could have anticipated. To give some context, I went out with my friends, two couples and one single guy. We often go out on weekends, and when we drink, we tend to go pretty hard. But this time, it was a little different. We started earlier than usual with an all-you-can-drink mimosa brunch. Now, we've all had those brunches where you're sipping on mimosas, thinking, I'm good, I can handle this. But the wait staff was on it. They kept bringing bottle after bottle. And before long, we'd all had way more to drink than we realized. The brunch food didn't really do much to counteract the crazy amount of alcohol. We were hammered. The vibe was loose, everyone was laughing, and things were escalating pretty quickly. So, after brunch, we headed back to my friend's place to hang out, maybe hit the pool later. At that point, my friend, let's call him Jake, was way more drunk than I'd ever seen him. He could barely stay awake and was sprawled out on the couch. The rest of us were still buzzed and loud, trying to keep the party going. What happened next? Well, I can barely piece it together. Jake and his girlfriend, Sarah, started kissing on the couch. I didn't think much of it at first. People get affectionate when they're drunk, right? But then, the other couple, Mike and Jess, started making out too, which was odd because I'd never really seen them be like that in front of me. Then, Jess leaned over and kissed Sarah. I mean, I've heard Jess is pretty open, and she's done things like this before in the group, but this was new territory for me. Before I knew it, things were getting more intense. Jake and Sarah were all over each other, hands everywhere. Mike was making out with Jess while the single guy, let's call him Tom, started getting involved. At first, it was just light touching, but then Tom was full-on fingering Jess, which led to him going down on her. At this point, I'm sitting there, too drunk to drive home, and wondering what the hell is happening. My car was at Jake's house, and I didn't want to Uber home and deal with getting my car the next day. So I stayed. I didn't know what else to do. Leaving would have been a whole ordeal. I felt trapped in a really bizarre situation, stuck between being too drunk to make a good decision and not wanting to be the weirdo just walking out. Then, the wildest part happened. Jess looked over at me and actually encouraged me to join in. I couldn't believe it. I told her that I couldn't, that my girlfriend wasn't there, and I didn't think she'd be cool with me jumping into something like that. Jess just shrugged and went back to what she was doing. The whole time, I kept thinking that maybe this would end, we'd all sober up, and then go to the pool as if nothing had happened. I was wrong. The longer I sat there, the weirder I felt. I tried going on my phone to distract myself, hoping to pass the time, but there wasn't really anywhere else for me to go. Jake's house isn't that big, and there wasn't another room I could hang out in. So, I just stayed. Eventually, after what felt like forever, things started winding down, and I waited until I felt sober enough to drive home. The whole time, I kept replaying what happened in my head. I didn't participate, but I didn't leave either. And now, I feel incredibly awkward and kind of gross about it. It's like I was just a voyeur, sitting there watching everything unfold. Now, I'm not sure how I'm supposed to feel. I mean, I didn't do anything wrong technically, but it feels like I crossed some weird line just by being there. I wasn't trying to be a creep, but I can't shake the feeling that I should have just left, even if it meant walking around outside drunk for a while. But at the time, it felt like there was no good option. My boyfriend has suddenly gotten violent, and I don't know what to do. It's past 2 a.m., and I'm lying on the couch, heart pounding, mind racing. How did it come to this? How did someone I thought I knew so well become a person I fear in my own home? Earlier tonight, everything was normal, at least as normal as things have been recently. My boyfriend got drunk again, which is not really unusual these days. We had already eaten dinner, and the fridge was full, but out of nowhere, he orders food through Uber Eats. He doesn't even have his half of the rent for Sunday, and here he is, throwing money on food we don't need. I didn't even make a big deal out of it. I just wanted to sleep, but when the delivery guy arrived, it all went south. The constant doorbell ringing woke me up, and when he finally got his food, I simply asked him to be quiet and stop talking to me so I could sleep. That's all.
But that's when everything flipped. He went from being a little drunk and annoying to full-on belligerent. He called me a liar, claiming he didn't order the food, which was literally sitting in his hands. Then he said the most terrifying thing. He picked up the takeout bag and said, Give me one reason why I shouldn't throw this hot food in your face right now. I froze. For a second, I couldn't believe he'd say something like that. Then panic set in, and I did the only thing I could think of. I screamed and grabbed my phone, pretending to dial the emergency number. It was the only thing that got him to back off. He muttered something under his breath and left the room, but my mind was spinning. What if he came back? What if next time he didn't just threaten me? I didn't feel safe in our bedroom, so I decided to sleep on the couch in the living room. But the door doesn't lock. My hands were shaking as I pushed a chair against the handle to block it. I just needed some peace of mind, even if it was makeshift. And of course, he heard me. I guess the noise from moving the chair caught his attention and suddenly, he was there again, pushing the door open aggressively, getting right in my face and threatening me. His eyes were wild, like he wasn't even the same person. I tried to hold the door closed, but he was stronger. The worst part was I didn't know what he'd do next. I've never felt this kind of fear in a relationship before. And now I'm sitting here, wide awake, too scared to close my eyes. How did it come to this? I moved to another country to be with him. I was so excited to start my master's degree and build a life together. And now that I've finished my degree, the only thing I want is to leave. I don't even need to be here anymore. I've done what I came to do. But I'm stuck. I don't have enough money for a plane ticket back home. And I'm embarrassed to ask for help. I feel trapped in this nightmare. In a place that was supposed to be my new start. The worst part is I know exactly how this is going to go. Tomorrow, he'll either act like nothing happened, claiming he doesn't remember, or he'll spin the whole thing, making it sound like I was the one who overreacted. He's done it before, twisting the truth until I start doubting my own memory of events. He's gotten so good at gaslighting me, I sometimes wonder if I really am the problem. But tonight, tonight I know I'm not crazy. I don't know what to do. My friends and family are back home, and I'm too embarrassed to tell them what's happening. How do I explain that the person I uprooted my entire life for has become someone I don't even recognize? I know deep down I should leave that staying here isn't safe, but the logistics feel impossible right now. And the guilt, God the guilt. I keep telling myself that maybe it's the stress. Maybe he's struggling with something I don't understand. Maybe if I give him space, things will calm down. But in the back of my mind, I know this is beyond stress or a bad day. It's crossed the line. As I sit here, I replay everything in my head, hoping for clarity. I need someone to tell me that his behavior is not okay. That I'm not overreacting. I need to know that it's not my fault he's acting this way. That his threats and anger are on him, not me. I can't live like this, but the way out feels blurry. For now, I'm going to try to sleep if that's even possible. But tomorrow, I need to figure out my next step. Whether that's leaving or finding some way to get help, I can't stay in this cycle of fear. Because this isn't love. This isn't the future I thought we'd have.